welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Now, over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. Now, today, we are honoured to be sitting down with Greater Sudbury, Ontario Councillor Natalie Labby. But before we get into today's interview, I just want to ask you to do a favour for me. If you can, and if you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're streaming this episode right now. It helps us get our message out there, and it helps us educate and inform citizens like yourself about the great work municipal leaders from across Canada are doing in their community. Now, on to the episode. Councillor, I want to thank you so much for sitting down with me today and talking about the city of Greater Sudbury, but also about yourself. And I want to start with the question that I've started all my interviews off with. So you're no exception to the first question. And that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Natalie? You know, uh, I, I, I took a long time to think about this because for the rest, for all of my life, since I've been young, I've been in leadership positions. And I think that I was fortunate to have uh, parents that fostered that in me from a young age, from whether it was starting out in Girl Guides and Pathfinders and talent shows and uh, leadership opportunities throughout my my education. Uh, it just it was just something that was uh, instilled in me. Uh, right out of high school, I was offered a wonderful opportunity to work for our local municipality in a um, uh, an intern role uh, in economic development and tourism. So I got to learn a lot about my community and I was a sponge at that age. And right around then was an election year federally. And I was recruited to, to go on the, uh, you know, boots to the ground and kind of help the campaign and re-election of our local MP. And I think that's where it really just started to get to uh, really be reinforced that I was made for leadership roles. And I took on a lot of opportunities um, at a young age as well to volunteer and just get connected and build my networking. And I didn't realize at the time that that was going to lead to something like this. Uh, but I know that it was definitely part and parcel. So I want to pick up on something you just said there at the end there that it you weren't expecting it to lead to something like this, which is municipal politics. I, I want to know, was politics discussed at the dinner table? While leadership, it seems like was talked about, was politics discussed at the dinner table? And more importantly, was municipal politics discussed at the uh, dinner table? It absolutely was. And, uh, you know, I wasn't raised in a home that was from a, a, a high income. I definitely consider us to be middle, you know, middle of the range kind of income with our family. My mom was a nurse and took a time off work to raise us. And that was just expected 48 years ago. Uh, my father was the breadwinner and uh, just you know, he owned uh, different companies, um, log trucks, um, a lot of industrial things, uh, topsoil. My grandfather had a farm and had topsoil contracts and, you know, uh, garbage contracts for our township in the town that we lived in. And so all of these gentlemen that were uh, part of that industry would come over and have pie after supper and they would just talk shop. And that was just, you know, part of of the landscape of what I what I was inundated with every single day. And um, fortunately for us, especially, you know, I think in a lot of smaller communities, um, the mayor and council uh, was definitely repeaters over the years and almost decades at times. And so we were very fortunate at the time to have a wonderful uh, example of a mayor um, and his name was uh, Robert Gallagher. And uh, I just remember my dad speaking very uh, highly of him and they had a lot of respect for him. And, you know, I also heard of a few other counselors that, you know, some of my dad's friends really didn't see eye to eye with their decisions and them as a person and that kind of thing. So I, I was thrown into that as well. But I'll tell you that uh, with having that part of the conversation, I think it helped me because at one point our little town was trying to build a new community center and there was a call out for more fundraising than what the province was going to provide. And given that's 40 years ago. So that's back when the provinces, well, province of Ontario at least, was very, very gracious uh, with their money, but that still wasn't enough. So my mom came to me at the age of nine and uh, said, you know, we need to help out our community to help them raise money for this arena. And I didn't really know how I could do that at nine years old. So I went door to door and we raised $800 Christmas caroling. 
And as a result, uh, the mayor and council found out about my donation and invited me to a council meeting. So here I was, nine years old, being coming into a council meeting, and all of these men, one woman, and subsequently it took her three tries to get elected back in the 80s to become a woman on council. And they welcomed me with open arms. It was just such a welcoming thing at nine years old, just feeling like, oh, I'm in this wonderful room. And you could, I, I felt because my parents had instilled that respect in me, that it was such a place of respect. And, and there was so much decorum that was expected of that. So it was instilled in me at a very young age. And it's something that definitely made an impact in me in the way that I lead and govern as a municipal leader now. Just for clarification standpoint, but uh, are you talking about when you were growing up the city of Greater Sudbury or are you talking about another community where no, you born and raised the, in the community? No, so I I just moved to Sudbury I, um, about 10 years ago and I was uh, raised, I was born in Sudbury though, but uh, we were uh, in a regional community about two hours uh, west of Sudbury called Blind River. And it was uh, about 4,500 population at the time, I guess. I think it's around 3,900 now, but that was my hometown growing up. One of the largest signs I've ever seen on the roadside driving from the Greater Sudbury to Sault Ste. Marie was Blind River. And I had to pull over and take a photo because it just popped out of nowhere. So I know it quite well. There you um, go. I, I, I want to sort of talk about the entrance into municipal politics. So you, you mentioned that you had an internship with the community, but you decide that your, your voice would be best served at the municipal table. What was it about the municipal allure of governance and politics that drove you in 2022 to say, this is what this is where I need to be to put to make a difference in my community? Well, first of all, Chris, I want to preface it by saying this is not my first time at, at the municipal table. So I was first elected in Northwestern Ontario when I was 35 years old in a little town called Manitowoc and a uh, population about 2200 at the time. And uh, it was, uh, you know, right in the middle, four hours right in the middle of East between Sault Ste. Marie and Thunder Bay, just off the beaten track of Highway 17. So about, uh, I think, 53 kilometers off the off the road. So uh, just because I was as a uh, my first husband and I had a logging company. So I took a leave of absence from my municipal job to help kind of start that business. And it brought us to contracts in Northwestern Ontario. So every time I moved, uh, I've lived in communities such as Wawa, uh, you know, Duberville, really small communities, uh, logging and mining towns. Um, I just, I wanted to make my, I wanted to make a difference and it's just who I was. And I wanted to make sure like if I needed some culture in my life, I needed, um, you know, a bunch of different things and meeting new people. So uh, when I first moved to Wawa, I threw myself in and resurrected the winter carnival there because they didn't have a winter carnival. Uh, when I moved to Manitowoc, I resurrected an entertainment series and branched out with all the Northwestern Ontario um, communities to try and make like a series of, of, of a tour, essentially. I'm really proud of that. And um, I just a lot of people got to know me through my volunteer work and uh basically I was in Manitowoc there was an election coming up uh I knew that the uh you know that that the, the I guess the palette of the community was that they really did want a full slate of new people at that time and I just I knew that I had the community support I was confident in that because I was a known person um people would call me for some reason just my personality and say ask me questions about different things and bylaws and different uh things about the community assuming that I was probably on council just through my personality and my connections within that town so you know it's not my first kick at the can uh, when I really, when I did move here in 2014 to Greater Sudbury, I moved to Capriol, which is part of the city of Greater Sudbury, because we got amalgamated in uh, 2020. So um, I threw myself into that community as well, and I took over the Santa Claus Parade. Uh, I've been doing that now. This is uh, be our 10th year, and I was able to volunteer with the Northern Ontario Train Museum, the Railway and Heritage uh, Museum, um, you know, the local legion, uh, some of the churches. I did some fundraising opportunities called Trick or Eat. It was a really cool thing where uh, people dress up in costumes, not on Halloween, and you go and do a food drive to raise money and food for the food bank. So I just, it's such a, a long resume. It's hard to really kind of 
summarize it up, but all of those things were leadership roles and, um, the outgoing um, incumbent for my ward, so Greater Sudbury has 12 wards in our in our city, uh, he was not going to run again. So a couple of years ago, he approached me and said, you know, I'm not going to run again. It had been his second term already. And he said, when I think of who my successor should be in the ward, uh, you're the first one that comes to mind, and I hope that you would consider it. And at the time, it really wasn't on my radar. However, uh, in my real job, in my full-time job, I'm an assistant manager at a Seniors Active Living Center. And I really love the work that I do. It's very um, meaningful work for me. And it's such a great juxtaposition to the stressors of municipal politics. And it's a really welcoming uh, environment. And coincidentally, a former longtime mayor of, of Sudbury, uh, Jim Gordon, is also on our board of directors. And one day in April, he came up to me and he said, I just want to tell you, uh, I lead and instruct a cardio drumming class, which is an exercise class. And we bang on drum, uh, five gallon Home Depot pails <laughs> to music and a playlist. And I developed this, this program and he, uh, at 87 years old and his wife are in the program and he approached me and he said, you've got such fantastic leadership skills. You've done such a great job in the last few years that you've been hired here. I see so many new programs and different initiatives that you've um, been instrumental in, in getting um, off the ground here. And I really feel that your, um, your personality is so, um, effective on everybody and uh, you'd be a wonderful breath of fresh air around our council table and I really hope that you'll consider running and I said wow Jim that's kind of interesting and wonderful and such an honor coming from him being our mayor for like you know 20 some years former MPP um, so that day I drove home and I thought about it and I said you know someone needs to take on this role and I wanted to make sure that whoever was going to be um representing the ward that I live in, lived in our ward, not that it's necessary, but I think for a lot of people, it's important, especially in the outlying communities that were amalgamated. Um, because as much as it's 20 some years ago, it's still very much a four letter word for a lot of them feeling that they've lost a lot of their autonomy, and a lot of core services. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that whoever was going to represent me and my needs and the needs of my community and the ward as a whole, uh, would would care and have the connections, and the um, just the I guess the understanding of how municipal government works and municipal government at a city level is a way different machine than a small community. However, um, the municipal act of Ontario is still the same. So, and the principles and leadership and the, the personality, um, you know, that it's just can't be taught. You either have that innately or you don't. And I, I knew that I had a lot of support. So we just went with it and here we are. I've never been able to ask this question on the show because you've served in municipalities in two different communities and over a substantial amount of time, I would say you left of the first community and then you got elected in 2023 because you moved in 2014 to Sudbury, greater Sudbury. Um, I, I kind of want to ask this question in, in a weird way. And I know I didn't prepare you for this question. So I do apologize for this because I want to know from your perspective, has the role of municipal governance, government and governance changed from when you were first elected in that first community to now as a city official in the city of Greater Sudbury? It absolutely has. Uh, not, so? just, not just because of population, mostly because of how social media is uh, <laughs> affects us. Uh, I just came back from a conference in London, Ontario a few weeks ago where it was very yeah. much a focal point at AMO. And uh, one of the focal points of one of the um, of the workshops was the amount of ed elected officials that have been elected since last year that have stepped down because of the pressures of social media. Um, people just being able to say and bully you and just it goes beyond the normal critical, uh, you know, criticism of I don't agree with that person it there's the personal attacks, um, you know, people are taking it higher to where they're almost stalking um, uh, certain counselors, uh, there's also uh, counselors behaving badly towards one another, right? There's an epidemic of that uh, where we didn't really hear about it as much. Uh, so definitely I feel that, that 
that's uh, different. Uh, here in Ontario, I feel it's also the landscape is different as well, because with changing of government at the provincial level, um, the downloading uh, of services has also uh, increased. So as where when I was first elected in 2010, there was still a lot more pot of provincial dollars to go around to kind of offset and subsidize those things. And for us here in Greater Sudbury, we're in a very unique position because when we were amalgamated and that was forced upon us, um, it's one of those things where we have 3,300 kilometers of road to maintain. We have all these outlying communities that all of a sudden our tax levy has to support all of these hundreds of extra kilometers that connect us from the core of the city to the outskirts of the city. And uh, our tax levy just can't sustain it. And there's no provincial funding to support that. So we're forced into a position of cutting services, uh, increasing user fees, and people feeling very taxed. Uh, to the point where they're almost taxed out of their homes and it's a very precarious situation that um is is before us and you know i'm gonna say this i was at an event where there was some some provincial money and a colleague of mine were there with the minister and we said thank you for coming to our city thank you for this funding opportunity today and no hesitation you're welcome counselor but if you want more of that you know how to vote in 2026. So, you know, right now, Greater Sudbury is definitely uh, federally, it's, it's, uh, we've got two um, ridings, uh, liberal ridings. So federally, we're getting a lot of support. However, uh, provincially, we have Sudbury and Nickel Belt that uh, oversee our area of our city, and that is NDP. So we're getting literal breadcrumbs from the provincial government. And we're the largest municipality in Northern Ontario, and that is not reflective in the provincial money that we're getting for our community. So it's definitely posing a challenge for us. Um, there's a lot to unpack there. And I want to start with this sort of area of topic. Municipalities have a certain role and responsibility in the Municipal Act, Governance Act, the MGA. But if you go talk to your residents in your community, they may talk to you about provincial issues. They may talk to you about federal issues. There is a jurisdictional line that each level of government has responsibility over. But the average resident, and I paint a very broad stroke of brush here when I ask this question, and I know I get people pissed off at me, and I apologize for asking you this question, but I want to know from my own standpoint, do people understand in the city the roles and responsibilities of the municipal governance compared to the provincial jurisdictions compared to the federal jurisdictions. So when people ask you questions and ask you have issues, are they talking about actual municipal issues? I really feel that the majority of people don't pay enough attention. They, <laughs> they do pay attention to the headlines. They've yeah. got big opinions about the headlines, but they don't involve themselves and engage to the level that they need to, to understand the differences. And it was definitely apparent uh, in the campaign time. Uh, some of the wards didn't have debates at all, which is unfortunate for me. I had two that I had to attend because my ward is so large. Uh, so it was able to prepare me for a lot of those questions. And it was, it was to the point where some people are thinking we're censoring the questions that they're bringing because we don't want to answer their questions. However, there's so many incidents of people asking us about things that are, you know, hospital related that we have no, we have, like, we don't have any power over that. It's not a municipal issue, but the majority of people just don't know. So, you know, we started something with the new mayor, Mayor Paula Fave. He's a fantastic leader for our community uh, in such a short year, uh, made so many strides as a new council. Uh, just having three newly elected and a new mayor has made a major difference in uh, the personalities around the table and the ability for us to bring back a level of decorum that's expected of us. And on top of that, he has initiated what's called town halls in all of the wards. So mine's coming up in a few weeks. And each one of us has had an opportunity to meet one-on-one -on -one with the mayor, with our community, in a community setting where people can submit their questions uh, instead of coming up to a mic because then it gets long-winded and you know gets off topic very quickly and some people get very heated. Um, but that's the reasons to submit your questions in advance, just to make sure that we're not answering questions about the federal government or the provincial government, that it really is about what's going on in our city. And uh, that's been really 
a positive way. They, they're, they're all recorded, they're uh, live streamed so that people can participate beyond the ward boundary as well. And that it's available online after for people to watch and listen and then engage and re-engage with your city councilor if you have further questions. So it's been a really positive step. It's not something that's ever been really done before in our city. And I feel that that's one big step forward for us as a new council in building that trust and building the engagement po and component of education about what's in what we're in control of and what we're not and also communicating the types of partnerships that we're seeking with outside agencies and levels of government to try and ensure that you know our infrastructure needs are met and our culture and arts um, needs are met and our recreation needs are met and those kinds of things for to maintain our quality of life here in Greater Sudbury. So the reason I asked that question is because you mentioned something in your previous statement about um, you, the city is feeling like it's getting the crumbs from the provincial government. And I, 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 I don't like to go political, but I like when I go political because it, it, it's a good top of a conversation. Do you feel as a councillor, and I say this as you as a councillor, not as the whole council, but your opinion, in your opinion, councillor, do you feel like the city has to go alone on some of these provincial issues when the province isn't stepping up to help in the jurisdictional roles that they're supposed to help with, whether it be mental health and addiction, whether it be health, whether it be this, the infrastructure funding, and you are then left holding the bag and trying to figure out how to pay for infrastructure projects, how to pay for roads, how to pay for water treatment upgrades, which then goes on the back of the citizens of the city of the greater Sudbury. It absolutely is. And I can give you one example specifically that's really plaguing us right now. Over the last year, we've pledged a million dollars to have a safe consumption site in our city. We've been waiting for provincial support for that, but it's been completely on the tax levy. And as we're going into budget talks for 2024, it's something that's a, a major um, major issue for our city right now with a lot of criticism from, from different places, uh, different agencies around the city and people who live here. Um, some people saying, don't support it. You're enabling the addiction. And some people are saying these people are being drug poisoned. We need to transition them from the safe injection site into transitional housing so we can provide those extra supports. But where's the money from the province in all of this? So that's a, a major one, especially when so many of our cities are plagued with an opioid crisis and a drug poisoning crisis. And, you know, one of the questions you submitted to me was like some some challenges that we face. We're right on the Trans Canada Highway, so any city or town that is located on that is having a homelessness crisis because people are coming by buses. They know, they hear that you know some communities are sending them to us, and we can't stop that. We can't prevent that from happening, but we can't do it on our own because we just don't have the resources on our tax levy municipally to support the level of services that are required to help these people get connected to um, those supports, you know, to, to help them so that it's not plaguing our city uh, at that level. So um, it's definitely one of the challenges. So it's the perfect segue into the, the the topic that you were just talking about. And before I ask this question, I'm going to preface it by saying this is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not a policy of council. This is the councillor's opinion. So, councillor, as of recording this episode, what do you see as one of the biggest issue or issues facing the city of Greater Sudbury today? Well, the one I just mentioned is is top of mind for sure. We don't have enough affordable housing. Uh, you know, we, our province has just uh, announced a lot of strong mayors. Um, it's a new thing that they're saying, hey, we want development. We don't care what it looks like. We need multi-residential uh, uh, housing stat. Uh, we have a goal for the city here to right now we have 168,000, give or take, people that are living in the community. We see opportunities for exponential growth in the next few decades decades for sure, whether it's in the mining sector, education and health uh, sectors, and we want to make sure that we're ready for that. And in order to get skilled workers and a skilled workforce to relocate here, or for our youth to stay and remain skilled and remain here, we need to make sure that we have adequate 
attainable and affordable housing, because there's a difference between the two um, in our community. Uh, so we would like to get to the 200,000 population in the next 20 years. Uh, so, you know, we're on target for that, but the challenge is the housing component. So again, we've got some great uh, support and commitment from our federal government in order to attain that uh not so much on the provincial front so um so I, know, I gotta I gotta interject here because i want to i i just had this exact conversation and i want to know how you as council and counselor are dealing with it you need people you need housing people won't come without housing housing won't come if you don't have people how do you balance the needs and wants of a community when you need to build but you only can build to what the population is or how many people want to buy houses because they can't afford them, they're not buying. So the supply is not going to get there unless they go down. So how does the city of Greater Sudbury look at this uh, issue and say, how do we build houses that are affordable, that are attainable in a, in a, in a sort of society that everything's unaffordable for a lot of people right now? Right. It's unaffordable for a lot of people, but at the same time, there's other people who are doing market research just to suggest that uh, because housing prices have doubled or tripled, that people who have lived in their homes for 40, 50 years and are wanting to scale back on the size of maintaining those homes are looking for uh, attainable housing uh, that is going to allow them to remain in the city and um, have their independence as well. So one way that we're going to ensure that that happens is um, what's cut, called a future Future ready community uh, committee that the mayor has launched, uh, and that's to cut the red tape, find out uh, why other cities are moving forward with development much quicker than we are, and find out where those inefficiencies lay, so we can eliminate them, eliminate all those barriers, and be business ready uh, so that when those opportunities come to us, obviously Southern Ontario is running out of green space to build. Where are they going to look? They're going to look at the largest uh, municipality in Northern Ontario where we've got so much growth potential and opportunity for different industries and they see those trends moving up and that's where they want to come. But if we're not ready for them, they're going to skip by us. So we're we're ready and we're, we're going to be open for business. Are developers knocking on your door right now? Yes, absolutely. It's actually a big sticking point because we've got one that uh, wants to build a six story building in a residential area and our uh, official plan doesn't really provide for that. Uh, however, we've got the ability at council to um, make contingencies for that. And of course, there's a lot of not in my backyard kind of protesting and and um, that kind of thing happening. So we're struggling with that. Uh, but, you know, I've done my research and there's so many communities that have fallen um, victim to the nimbyism and it's preventing them from moving forward. And here in Ontario, um, some municipalities are actually getting fined for putting up those roadblocks and not allowing development because we're in a housing crisis for our entire province. So we're in line with uh, making that happen. And uh, we want to work well. We want to um, we want to improve our reputation uh, and make sure that we are definitely uh, seen as a, a key player in developing Northern Ontario. During a budget cycle where you're sort of stuck in this perpetual cycle of only being able to rely solely on property taxes and mill rates and not the provincial government. Um, and the affordability crisis has caused things to increase in costs and costs need money. And you don't want to raise your taxes 10, 15% to offset those cost increases. How do you see yourself and your role as counselor in balancing what you need to do to grow the city, but not on the backs of the people who are here today? So it's it's a great timely question, actually, because we're moving into uh, discussions for uh, a few different initiatives. One is that we've never done it before. We're going to have a two-year operating budget and a four-year capital budget. So we're hoping in order to do that, uh, it's going to say, it's going to have uh, actually realized some, some efficiencies in contracts, because as we do a year over year budget, we're waiting and our infrastructure department um, and growth and infrastructure services are saying, do we award this contract? What do we do? Is council gonna approve this? And they're always waiting. So by doing a four-year capital budget, 
we're going to be able to look ahead on the infrastructure that needs to get done. And then the scope of tendering is going to be a broader timeline, which a lot of the costs of these construction and infrastructure improvements uh, is borne by uh, mobilizing equipment to a site. So, you know, and then uh, all of these companies not sure, are they getting that job? Who are, how are they going to employ other people if they don't get the contract? So this will be a way, hopefully, this is what we're, we're, we're uh, anticipating that it's going to give us a four year um, crystal ball, right? This is the projects that are going to happen because we're going to tender them in that length of time and we're committing to that. So that's one initiative. The other one is that, um, I really ran my campaign on understanding the difference between it's a nice to have and a need to have. And I think that that's where we need to stand firm on ourselves with these budgets. Um, often it's an executive leadership team that kind of oversees and directors that are overseeing budgets. And they're, you know, and no disrespect, they're not on the ground. They don't have boots on the ground where they're actually seeing the inefficiencies in the way that they're doing things. So I've said it before at our, my, our very first council meeting, actually, um, that I think it's so important that we go directly to those people, the people who are working in our waste and wastewater, um, in, in our recycling, in our garbage collection, in our roads, those are major infrastructure departments and who better to know where the inefficiencies and the wasteful spending is than those people. So I'm really hoping with our new, the new motion that we have coming forward, that that's going to be part of the process working with our CAO to have that open uh, survey of sorts, uh, anonymous survey of sorts, because we don't want anyone to feel that they're targeted by, you know, um, speaking up. I really want people to feel safe in that environment to say, listen, and, you know, people have realized in a very short amount of time that um, although it's frowned upon generally to go straight to a counselor to kind of talk about your concerns and, um, you know, as an employee, oh. they're, they are coming, they're, they're coming to me, I'm keeping them anonymous and I'm going to, I'm able to go to these directors and these managers and saying, why are we doing things this way? right? Um, can we not do it this way? Can we have a broader conversation about why we're doing it this way? Um, so that we can have some cost savings, but it's definitely going to be a conversation that we're having this coming Tuesday about ways that we can cut inefficiencies so that we don't have to keep reducing services and increasing taxes unnecessarily. So, you know, we do have an auditor general that we hire. It's an external um, person within the city that is kind of doing these audits of efficiencies in different departments. And we rely heavily on those kinds of third party arm's length opinion uh, of where we can find some in, some efficiencies. But uh, I think that if we go directly to our people, that we're going to have the most success if we do it that way. You, you just talked about the nice to haves and the needs to haves. Now that's from the city's perspective, but we can't forget about the people as well, because people have their own wants to haves and needs to have. And traditionally, councillors are there to elect everyone, uh, to represent everyone. While you're elected as a ward, you're there to represent the entire city. How do you ensure that you have the wants to have the needs to have for the cities without forgetting about the wants and the needs of your individual residents because you're there to represent the people and you're also there to represent the city but the people have elected you and their issues are important to them whether it be a pothole whether it be a new park a park upgrade and when a budget comes around you need to advocate as a city without forgetting about the people so how do you do that we do it in a really great way. When we were amalgamated, we started what's called community action networks for the ward system. Uh, because the city used to just be the whole of a city and then all these outlying communities were their own municipalities and it just kind of merged. So we have 12 wards. So we have community action networks. They're made up of volunteers uh, elected and they, they have an election among the community that, that shows up for these meetings. Broadly advertised where anyone is welcome within the ward system to meet. Each of the city councillors is an arm's length kind of overseer and partner with and collaborator with uh, these, these CAN meetings. And uh, we meet on a regular basis. And then the ideas for 
those nice to have projects are actually coming from the residents who live in those wards. Okay. So each ward is unique. Uh, mine uh, specifically is the largest one. We typically have about 14,000 people in each ward, um, but it takes, takes me an hour and 15 minutes to get across mine because it's not densely populated, but it's huge. I have five unique communities uh, ranging from, you know, semi-rural to farmland, a million dollar cottages on lakefront, uh, you know, um, it's, it's just, it's a whole, it's a whole bunch of, it's a nice big puzzle and each one has their own strengths and weaknesses and opportunities. And I, I'm really proud of our ward and full of really great people with great ideas. So who better than to tell us what they need in the place they live than the people that live there. So it's a really great system. Uh, we it, have, it sounds great, like it. Yeah, we have an operating grant system that's an annual contribution that council allots and also a capital system so that if it's not used in a year, it's it it grows every year. Uh, and it's essentially um, like a seed uh, fund. So, you know, where we can have some some groups will come to, to the can and say, listen, um, and they can also come to council for more than a certain amount, like if it's at more than $1,000 or more than $10,000, you know, that kind of thing, uh, we can award that. And it's a very simple project process. It's like a one pager request. It's not lengthy, like a trillium grant or anything like that. And as long as the money's there and it, it it's uh, it aligns with all the different um, strategic direction of, of what that money can be used for, it's awarded. And um, the community each in, in each of those wards are able to go to different people in the private sector as well to leverage those funds. So a dollar of tax levy money is actually $4 or more, right? Like we've got uh, a, an outdoor rink project where people, the volunteers went together and bought, um, sold advertising dollar um, placades around the arena and to help build the arena. And so, you know, it's just, it's, and and then people put in kind donations of construction companies to to put the cement down and build the boards and, yeah. and put the lighting in and all of that. So it's really community driven projects and we're really proud of that. It gives them some autonomy and they, they're the, the you know, if they say we want a splash pad, Okay, or we want a dog park, or we want, um, you know, upgraded basketball nets, or we want squash courts, because we've got a lot of seniors in our community, we want the squash courts, we don't want this one, you know, we find ways and we work with our staff in all those different departments. And we utilize that money, leverage it, and that's how we're able to prioritize. And that way, the bigger infrastructure projects that we may or may not be able to get some provincial or federal partners with, is more in line of what we as a council can make decisions on according to our strategic plan, according to a lot of different factors. We have, um, you know, what's called a CEEP. It's an environmental plan. All these kinds of have zero net footprint and all these other kinds of things. So we've got a bunch of different strategic di direction of where we want to go. And I'm really glad that when we get reports from our staff, when something's come before council, it actually identifies all these different strategic directions and how it affects each one of those strategic directions or if it doesn't fit is identified. So we're able to quantify how important this decision is under our budget and how where it aligns for our direction of what we've um, what we've put in place for our city in the future. So it's a really great system. Now I'm not going to burst your bubble here, but you know, and I know that you're not going to please 100% of the people with 100% of your votes, particularly around budget, because there's always going to be the keyboard warriors who say they could do it better and you should have cut this or could, should have cut that. And that's Chris Brown saying that that's not the counselor saying keyboard warrior, that's Chris Brown. <laughs> Send your emails to me, everyone. How do you respectfully communicate with people to ensure that their concerns are heard about how you voted and how you decided on an issue uh, with what they believe is right? Because respect goes two ways. You have to respectfully tell people if they ask how you voted and how why you voted the way you did, if it means increasing taxes or increasing service fees. How do you do that in a respectful way and ensure that residents because we talked about the social media aspect of people resigning and counselors leaving the job, do it in a respectful way to make sure that people aren't feeling like you're just another politician who gets elected and doesn't communicate with the people. Right. And you're always going to get those different groups of people that are one way <laughs> or the other on an issue, you know, especially here in Sudbury, we're, we're looking at 
at you know either renovating or building new with our community arena or OHL arena and the costs associated with that and you know there's it's so many people are like build brand new and no renovate and no no don't waste money and like it's it's really been a div divisive um issue for us over the last seven years like it's it's so bad uh so but I'll give you an example and I think I'm only responsible for my vote and how 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 I vote. So I, I I appreciate that part of things at the municipal level because once you get to provincial or federal level, that's not really the case. But here I have my own autonomy on how I vote. So um the way I explain it to people, because I had someone, it's a different ward about this six story building and it shouldn't be in my neighborhood and all these different things. And people are saying, I really hope that you're going to say no to this. And I just take the opportunity because for me, especially if it's not in my ward, if it's something that I'm not sure of, I go and I physically visit that area. There was an issue back in the in the spring uh, about building a certain sidewalk and it was over a million dollars and I just couldn't understand the reasoning behind it. I went there, I asked a few other counselors to come with me, we walked the space, we went there after school one day where the school buses and the congestion and we were strategic in a way that we don't want to make this personal, it can't be about your word versus my word, it has to be about what is prudent and fiscally responsible and the reasons why. So I think that when I explain certain things to people they might not like it but they're going to respect the way that I came to making my decision and I'm very open about that so um, as long as I can maintain that level of respect um, and of course you're still going to get a few that you're not going to ever please and at the end of the day that has to be okay because we were the ones who were tasked um, with representing the city and we're the gatekeepers of, of what's going on. And I've always said, like, you don't, I think some of us, all of us in leadership roles specifically, we at some point in our career, and it might be on repeat sometimes where we have imposter syndrome. Do I deserve to be at this table? Who am I to be at this table over someone else? Basically, I'm someone who put my neck out as it takes a lot of guts and courage to do what we're doing and put myself on a ballot. I was prepared. I was ready the day that it was opened. I went door to door. I built my team of people who were going to support me, people who were connected in the community that could advocate for who I was as a person. And I wasn't just saying who I was. I was who I'm saying I am. And just building that network so that I could represent them. And, you know, some people are hard on us saying, oh, another photo opportunity. Oh, you know, she's at another fundraiser or a gala or, you know, people, I think the majority of people like to see us because I don't want someone at the end of my four years saying, where's Waldo? Where was she the last four years? What did she do? I'm out there. Uh, the local media is paying attention to things that I say at the council table because I'm not afraid to speak up or challenge things. And I do it in a respectful way. I'm building relationships and I don't have to have an ENG or an LLP or a PhD or any of those things behind my name to make sure that I have a seat at the table. I'm representing a cross section of a lot of people in the ward that I represent. And I believe that's why people voted for me. I just realized we're at the 50 minute mark and I haven't even talked about tourism. So we're going to jump into that quickly, if that's sure. okay with you. Sure. I want to talk about tourism because I think tourism is a, a thing that municipalities need to promote more because there's so many hidden gems across this country that we don't talk about. As someone who was just recently in the city of Greater Sudbury, who spent a few, a few hours there because he had to wait for his tire to get repaired while he was driving across Canada. I got to see a certain area of the city, but I got to ask you, you, what are some of the hidden gems for a tourist who might be coming to the city of Greater Sudbury to see or potentially take in over a few days or a few weeks? Because it seems like there's so much going on in that community when I was there. Absolutely. And, you know, I think the biggest resource that we have is for tourism is how welcoming our city is, especially our outlying communities and how rich our our volunteers are so that there's almost every single weekend there's something going on in the greater city of Sudbury. It might not be happening in the core of the city, but it's definitely happening in the broader communities as well. There's so many volunteer groups having festivals and events, and there's so much culture and arts that's going on here uh, from live music and all different genres. Uh, we've, um, 
we've got class act, um, um, live theater productions and all of that. Uh, we've got the Big Nickel. We have Science North, uh, Dynamic Earth. Out in Caperell, where I live, it's about 30 kilometers outside of the, sub, of, of the city core, is the Northern Ontario Railway Museum and Heritage Centre. It's the top three visited site in all of Sudbury and it is a wonderful, wonderful railway museum where they have a life-size model of a train um, going through. It's just, it's really wonderful and incredible. Um, where you're actually, Caperell is actually the location where they make Letterkenny and Shorzy. So I don't know if you're familiar with, with that phenomenon, but uh, we're very proud to have them uh, filming right in our community. So there's a lot of buzz. Uh, we've got a fantastic film industry going on here in Northern Ontario, and there's so many films being made here. Um, there was one not too long ago called Zombieland with Dan Aykroyd. And like, it's just, we've got some big stars coming to Sudbury and they're using um, the landscape, you know, we've got 330 lakes within the vicinity of our city and people are coming here. And when people come to visit here where they're, those kinds of things are putting us on the map, they're coming here. They want to move here because as much as life is expensive, it is a more affordable than down South. We have a, a greater pace of life here and, you know, you can really enjoy your career and all of these extracurricular activities and trail systems and whether it's snowmobiling or hiking or mountain biking or uh, ATV trails, like we've got it all in our city and in our outlying communities. So um, Sudbury is fantastic. We've got the Place des Arts. Um, a fantastic uh, French um, uh, theater that uh, is a is a, is an art gallery and for live presentations, not just for the francophone community, but but made for that purpose. And uh, what a what a wonderful um, addition to our downtown landscape that is. I, I'm just going to just pick up on something you just said there, but the friendly atmosphere. Now, as I as I jokingly said, I did br uh, blow a tire while I was driving in the, your community. And uh, two of your residents stopped and pulled over and helped me. They made sure I was okay. And uh, it was such a welcoming experience uh, having people just do something out of the goodness of their heart. And uh, I can only uh, express my gratitude to uh, the young man and the young uh, female who helped me out. And I appreciate them stopping and helping me get into town to try and find a local uh, uh, tire dealership. So just passing that on to you as the counselor for the city of Greater Sudbury. Um, I appreciate that. And it doesn't surprise me at all. I want to ask the million dollar question now and to wrap this entire interview up because I feel like we've only scratched the surface, but I want to, because I know you're busy, I want to wrap it up here by saying this. In your opinion, what makes the city of Greater Sudbury such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? You know, it's all encompassing from mining sector, health, education. We we have top of the line education. We have a Northern Ontario School of Medicine here. Uh, our 330 lakes, the people are the best part. Like they're so welcoming, friendly. We've got so much multiculturalism here. Uh, we're part of a rural Northern um, in immigration project that's bringing young people and families of, of different, different uh, uh, immigration and um, status and cultures to our city. Um, just a melting pot of the north and I think that that's what's making us stand out right now um, you know we've got a lot of different challenges but at the heart of it it's the great people that live here uh, the volunteers that are relentless that give of themselves their time their talents and make our Sudbury greater uh, so you know um, we can't say enough about the wonderful people that make up our community um, Councillor, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, I know I said 45 minutes and we're at the hour mark, but I <laughs> appreciate you taking time and sitting down and talking about the city of Greater Sudbury, but also about yourself. Uh, I think municipal politicians don't get the credit that they deserve. And I want to thank you for serving your community and stepping up and making your community such a better place. So thank you. Well, you're welcome. And you know, I'm not doing it alone. I, I'm one person of 13 and uh, very fortunate to be working with such an uh, incredible team of people that genuinely care about the future of our city. And we're, we're working together collaboratively to make that happen. Thank you for joining us for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in diving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring 
and essential to our mission of the show. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content like you saw today. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support as well. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page, conveniently linked in the show notes, or by visiting www.crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content that you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of the Cross Border Interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.